Hey guys, welcome to Rock Talks. Today we are talking to Bobby Burns, guitar player of Primer 55 on Murder of the Flesh. We discuss the album's introduction to Mayhem and the new release, what it was like to play at Ausfest 2000, the breakup of the band, and the possibility of a future without Jason Latrell on vocals. If you like this interview, please give me a thumb up, leave a comment, and share the video with all your friends. Also, very important, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell. Hello, Bobby. Thank you so much for your time. Welcome to Rock Talks. Glad to be here, man. Thanks for having me. All right. So how are you, man? How are you doing? Doing good. Doing well today. All right. All right. So let's get right into the music, first of all, because, you know, Most people, that's what they, they want to know. Let's go way, way back to the year 2000. You know, the album Introduction mm -hmm. to Mayhem. I remember it was, it was very well received by, by fans and critics all over the world, especially in the, in the States. So my first question is, what, what was the secret for the success of, the, of that album? There wasn't really any secrets. It's like, um... Me personally, I grew up like wanting to have a record deal and wanting to be like, you know, famous and tour buses and playing for big crowds and stuff like that. But it's like as I got older and then like, you know, I wanted that when I was like in high school. And then that dream kind of went away for a second. And I ended up in like living in Memphis, Tennessee, just riding a skateboard around all night with my dog and, you know, and playing music, playing these songs and stuff like that and writing them. And at that, that whole, what I thought music was had left me at that point. And I was just like being a person and writing songs that totally meant something to me. And, uh, You know, it's when I met Jason and we clicked on that level because we would ride around, you know, Memphis on skateboards as well. And um, it was that whole weird thing. And then all of a sudden, once both of us had forgotten about anything about having a record deal, we got one. Mm -hmm. Like out of the blue. Yeah. And we didn't even actually have it. I didn't have a band at the time. Uh when Primer 55 record first came out. I had the songs, most of them, but um, it's like, I would like make demos with other people and have like different people sing on them. And somebody got, I was playing, I was recording some tracks for a, a different record in memphis and somebody i left a demo tape that me and jason had just done it had loose trip in the head and the big fuck you on it three songs on cassette and somebody like left it because of like the drummer that was playing on that record too played the drums on those and that's how we got a record deal it got left at the studio and somebody picked it up and like called me Or text me. I had pager at the time. Mm -hmm. There wasn't no cell phones yet. So yeah, yeah. No, I didn't have a cell phone. So they paged me. Right. I called them back for the pay phone. So I put a band together really, really fast. Interesting. And what do you remember yeah. about the writing and recording process of that album? It was weird. Because the people that were calling was this independent label called a uh, propellant transmission. And, um, it's, I don't remember the guy's names. Brian Brinkerhoff was one of them. And Derek, o Brian Brinkerhoff and Derek Oliver were the people that started uh, calling me. And, um, they were like, you know, we love the stuff and, you know, and like, we're going to make this record. The first, like, introduction to Mayhem was actually an EP called As Seen on TV. Yeah, yeah. It was released in 99, yes. right? Yes. That was our demo. 
and like we only had like four or five songs so we're like writing songs in the studio as we go to make this band happen and i'm playing it both guitar all the guitar parts and all the bass parts and all the drums were programmed and stuff like that um and then once that ep came out a couple of months later that the EP, the Ask Seen on TV EP, started getting major label attention. And so then we had that whole thing going on with, with Island Def Jam was called Mercury at the time uh, yeah. in the States. Yeah. I remember. With Biohazard and stuff like that. Yeah. And, um, and all these other labels like Geffen and stuff like that was, uh, was trying to get us. They started this bidding war. And all we were doing around was like still riding our skateboards being punk ass kids getting flown to like Los Angeles and New York to play songs for these labels. And we finally ended up with Mercury at the time. But the whole time they told us that we we're going to call it Island Death Jam with Rick Rubin was there and uh, Leo Cohen. Um, so we felt comfortable, or I did, going with Island Def Jam because I was like, you know, I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. I want to make records the way I want to make them. Uh, you know, still, they, they're all still thinking we have a band, but we don't. We were just getting friends to play bass and drums during the shows. Um, but it was still only just me and Jason. So we faked our way through that. <laughs> Well, it's just like a bunch of songs written, but when it came down to it, it was like we weren't a band that like played together for like three years or four years on the club scene before we got a record deal. You know, uh, the songs spoke for themselves. And okay. the backstory of that became what it was, but what they wanted it to be, you know? And it's a weird story about how to get a record deal. Don't follow my advice. Yeah. But, you totally. know, you know, because I get I, I totally give it up at that point. I was just writing songs. Yeah. You know, so you, writing, you got the talent, you got great. the songs, you got the a, a, a good a very good singer, but you yeah. got really lucky too to in order to get this uh, record deal with the yes. major label. Yeah. Yes. Without a band. <laughs> without a rhythm section, without a bass player or a drummer. <laughs> and, and we went in, we, we made Introduction to Mayhem without a bass player or a drummer. Because I once again played all the guitar and the bass tracks. And the first record was like drum programming. So it was more like a duo instead of a band, right? It was, yeah. It was like it was a partnership with me and Jason. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll be like this happened to me today. We work on lyrics, and you know, I'd, I'd bring him a song like on a four track recorder or a cassette tape. And, and maybe, like, maybe that's uh, maybe that's that's why you, uh, you and, and Jason were the only remaining members through the whole history yeah. of the band, right? For sure. Everybody else was just like always hired guns, you know. Um, as the band evolved and stuff like that. You know, we always switched so many members. I mean, I don't know who holds the records for the most members, probably like an 80s band or something like that, LA Guns or something. <laughs> But um, maybe. But like we had a big revolving door of drummers, especially, and, uh, you know, a couple of bass players. Um, it, wasn't a, it wasn't until around I started writing the new release that I actually wanted two other people in the band to give them ownership, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, Premier 55 got a slot on the second yeah. stage of the Ozfest 2000. And yeah. first, what, yeah. how did you get that uh, slot in, the, in this uh, huge festival back then? And what's yeah. your best memory about that? The best memory was... Um, I don't know if it was how we got on it or being on it. Tell us both, please. <laughs> okay, yeah. How we got on it was like 
we were playing the Hollywood Palladium in Los Angeles, California. And I think, uh, if I remember correctly, Henry Rollins was on the bill in Anthrax and uh, a couple Who else, other bands. excuse me, besides Anthrax? Henry Rollins. Oh, all right, Henry Rollins, all right. Yeah. Nice, nice bill. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. And then us, you know. So we went out there and played. And What year was this? This would have been 99, 1999, um, okay. or early or early 2000. It actually, it would have been 99 because we were already touring by then. Mm -hmm. um, we'd already done tours with Biohazard and Machine Head and stuff, or not Machine Head, but Biohazard. And um, I don't remember who else, but we'd already been touring a lot. But um, our, our friends that we had to, as our rhythm section at the time for the introduction of Mayhem live band, I guess you'd call it, um, something happened on stage where our drummer like stopped playing or something like that. And Jason turned around and like gave him this glare. It's like, you know, you're going to blow it because, you know, like Sharon Osbourne was there and Jack Osbourne was there. Uh, Brett Michaels from Poison was there. And, uh, you know, it was pretty cool. And uh, like, I thought we blew it, you know, in front of Sharon Osbourne because our managers, like uh, Warren Etner uh, Management, they had us, they had the Deftones, they had Faith No More back in the day. Mm. Um, so we had, you know, good managers and stuff like that, but um, they're like, man, you guys really fucked us up. And uh, so we were backstage and I remember Jason just going to town on our drummer at the time and wanting to kill him when Sharon Osbourne walked in with Jack. It was a very violent situation that turned into a good outcome. That's all I can say, really. <laughs> it wasn't good for him because he was like on a plane a couple of days later, but uh, yeah. it was it was crazy. It's been an interesting band, that's for sure. Yeah, so another lucky yeah. hit for you. <laughs> it was because our manager was like, you know, you blew this opportunity. You know, we want to fire you. You guys are horrible. You guys are a bunch of punks. You don't know how to act in public. <laughs> and um, yeah. So, but like we went on with the tour, just like we do. Yeah. Um, a couple of days later, he's like, you know, our manager called us and he was like, you know, Sharon called me and said, you're on Ausfest. So she wants you on Ausfest. And I was like, I don't know how a fucked up show and violence can <laughs> land a gig on Ausfest, but it did for us. <laughs> So pay attention, <laughs> pay attention, new bands. If you want to get a slot on the other yeah. fight with your drummer and Beat stop, drummer. <laughs> stop playing during the show. <laughs> That's yeah. really interesting. <laughs> I did a lot you of know, I, I, and I never got the stories like this, and we only been doing this for 10 minutes, I guess. <laughs> you know, I've, I've said this story many times, but, like, you know, I, I don't know if it's not interesting or what, but I mean, there's always more beef because, like, Power 55 was, like, a very volatile band. Like, if we weren't beating your ass, we could possibly beat each other's ass on stage yeah. during the show. So it's just like, it was a band like that. It's like, you know, it's just a bunch of punk kids. And but it, was, it worked for us. Yeah. But not necessarily for other people, right? <laughs> yeah. So what do you remember about uh, the actual tour, Ausfest 2000? Because you were on the second stage, and I think you shared a stage with Kitty. Uh, yep. So, Disturbed. No, Soulfly. Which do you, you must remember. Yep, Soulfly, Disturbed, Kitty. Uh, Taproot, I think. Reveille, Taproot, uh, Reveille, like I said. Um, pitch shifter, dead lights, pitch shifter. Yes, yeah. those guys are great. 
but it would always rotate because you'd be on the second stage because you'd always play the main stage. You know, yeah, so it always like flopped into a big loop. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the the main stage sucked because everybody right. was so far away. Oh, and like we were never that really that kind of band. Um, so the main the, the days we were on the main stage, it just like I don't know, it was like arena rock or something like that. But um, maybe it's good cool, for exposure, but, like, you know, to 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 get the yeah, attention. like there's a bunch of. Yeah. Yeah, there'd be like a bunch of seats and everybody setting down or whatever. And they'd be like little small pits. But like the second stage was where it's at because that's what it's no seats. You're not setting down. You're just really, really hot. Yeah. Because it's scorching weather. And Stacked. everybody's having a good time. People yeah. Going crazy. Yeah. But it's more like, yeah, a, for like sure. a, let's say, underground concert vibe, right? With tons of people. And totally. Everybody. Very, yeah. yeah. Very intimate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, you uh, the singer from Head PE uh, recorded uh, some vocals for the song "Set It Off," right? So yeah. How did this happen? Since you didn't have a band and you pretty much get a record label like from out out of nowhere, <laughs> out of the blue. My attitude, my attitude at the time is like I I can do whatever I want now because I have money. Yeah. I, this label gave me money, so yeah. like yeah. Back in the like day, when there always, was a big budget for new bands. <laughs> when 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 people actually got record deals, like we were one of the last bands to do that to actually get money to make a record. Um, so I was just like, I need, you know, I'd like to have Jared from FPE sing on the song, set it off. And I left this whole bridge section out of the song, and I told Jason, you know, what I wanted to do, and he was like totally down with it. Um, totally fans great band and uh jay i remember jared coming in we picked him up from the airport in new york we we recorded all of our records in new york city and uh he came in and he had like a note no a notebook and like a pencil and didn't have a damn word on it and he was like okay i'm ready <laughs> i was like all right And he just went in there and like freestyled this whole thing. You know, a couple takes and it was actually perfect. It was just weird, man. It's really weird. Jared's a good dude. He's like, yeah, you know, he can, he knows his stuff. He'll he'll go in and lay it down. And that's yeah. exactly what he did. And he's like, all right, I'm done. <laughs> One take, maybe? Perfect. Yeah, it's a couple, two. That's really good. Yeah, yeah amazing. Scene. With just off, off the top of his head. Just listening to the song as it played. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. So last night I, I was uh, paying uh, really close attention to the album, the new release, right? The second mm-hmm. <clears throat> Primer 55 album. Yeah. Of course, everybody uh, give, give props to the first one, Introduction to Mayhem. But in my opinion, yeah. I think that the new release is a better album in the sense that the production is is great great right. and also the songwriting because it sounds much more mature uh, maybe more right. catchy and even heavier than the first album uh, do you agree right i do um it's like you know probably 55 from the beginning to that point changed so much And like I said, you know, it goes back to the money and the people are being able to afford, afford their own part apartments now and stuff like that. And like I bought a house and so everybody's like, oh, well, I'm rich and famous now. So I have all this money in the bank and like I can do whatever I want to. I was like the only guy in the band that never went out and bought like a Ferrari or like a Cadillac or anything like that. I, you know, I had a, I drove a Saturn. I bought used. Yeah. The first car I bought with my record deal money was a used Saturn. But because I always wanted to make my money work for me and I always put it back in the band. And uh, at that point, everybody had already been using stuff and, you know, 
getting the darker side of music and everything like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was cool with it. And I'm not an innocent person, but I was always a person with a head on my shoulders. And when it came time to write that record, um, you know, the label came to me. is like, you know, you ready to make another record? And I was like, of course I am. Doesn't matter if I have any songs or not. I'll make it happen. And I didn't have any songs. I had, I had, um, I had written this life. That's the song I had written for the new release record. Um, and that's it. I didn't have nothing else. I had ideas in my head, but nothing down. It was uh, and, very um, quick because the introduction to Mayhem was released on January 2000, and the new release was in September 2001, right? Yeah. So yep. it was less than two years uh, in, in between both albums. Right. That's a lot of stuff. I have to go through things before I can write a song. Um, I can't just sit down and write you a song. I can't even sit down and write you a lullaby. I mean, I have to live that. To I, I just can't do it. I can't like spit record after record out. But like just being in the band, Prime 55, was enough inspiration and personal um, things to go through to, to have that record ready in my head. Like I always have it ready in my head. It just might take me a minute to get it down on paper. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> like I said, like even Jason was not available sometimes during that whole writing session, which like I wrote a lot of those songs by myself. You mean the um, lyrics? Everything. Yeah. And once again, guitars, bass, <laughs> you know. Pretty much a one man band. Vocals, vocals. I sang on the record because some yeah. parts couldn't be done. You know? Yeah. Um, that's the first time I ever sang. And I don't know, like I, I left the studio that day going, I don't know if this sucks or it's good or people gonna love it or hate it, but yeah. I gave it my best shot. So I think you did a, a great job. So every so to everybody ah. who is watching this interview, do yourself a favor and go and check out the, the album, the new release by Primer 55. In my opinion, again, it's uh, better than the first one because, you know, everybody in these new metal uh, forums, new metal Facebook pages, uh, when somebody's talking about Primer 55, uh, most of them uh, talk about the first album, right? Because uh, it has a huge right. impact in 2000 because Auspice, Auspice and Touring. But uh, like I said, the second right. one is is uh, better produced, uh, better sound, better songwriting, but yeah. it is what it is, you know. And also, I was reading something about uh, the promotion, the marketing plan for this uh, album, the new release. Uh, is it true that Island Record Records got support uh, to the album after 9-11 uh, happened? They didn't want to... <sighs> We we stayed on tour because I started spending my own money. I paid for the bus. I we sat on the side of the road. We were in Baltimore, Maryland, when the planes hit the building, and I paid for us to get all the way to Florida on a tour bus out of my own pocket, just to try to keep it together. To maybe things would lighten up because I said, uh, and nobody knew what was going on, you know, really, that everybody was going to be scared to come out. So we just kept pulling up from town to town and nobody would come out because they were afraid everything would get blown up or whatever. Um, so, and Dry Ecologic was, I was getting ready, I was trying to take Dry Ecologic out on tour with us, but they were in, stuck in Europe oh. when that happened. So they could never catch up with us. And that's when I was like, you know, And oodles and oodles of other things happened with the band within that time and the writing of that record, the new release, um, that just kind of made me go to the label. And I was like, you know, our uh, A&R person at the time was like, you know, Bobby, why don't you go home and write another record? You know, give you money and, you know, you know, you know do your thing. And I was like, you gotta be freaking kidding me. 
I mean, I just, I mean, I went through a lot of stuff to write the new release record. A lot of stuff. Like, personal things to go through that. And the band was like a chaos at the time. So me and Jason were chaos. And, you know, it's just, I was just like, absolutely not. I'm not going to do this. I was like, you know, I'll go home for a little bit, but I'm not writing another record right now. It's going to take me at least another year to write another record when I feel like it. And um, that's when I started having problems with the label. But, I mean, I made, I told Jason he needed his tonsils taken out when I was in the studio already recording the new release record. And Jason was in the hospital getting his tonsils taken out because I told him he needed to so I could make the record by myself. Mm-hmm. And I was up there in the studio in, like, in upstate New York in the woods uh, making the record <laughs> and, you know, waiting for Jason to get better. And, you know, it's, it's hard to, to, to he was, Jason was my, was my best friend. Yeah. And then towards the end, it was bad. But it was like I had to keep going and moving and moving along. But like I'm not, I can't deal with any like rock star stuff other than my own, I guess. But um, there's yeah, like nothing I'll never call myself. Yeah. Yeah. You have to keep it professional, professional level, right? Sort of. Yeah. So sadly, Jason passed away like three, three years ago. I know, like yeah. you said, he was your your best friend. You you made two great albums uh, with him. You went on tour for what, like four years, maybe, maybe more. Uh, yeah, of, at least. Right? Well, it's like it's more than that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what's the uh, yeah, the best memory that you remember about? Being with Jason, not, not only as a, a band mate, but also as a friend. It's when, right before we got a record deal in Memphis. That was my the, my best memories of Jason. And Jason was just a crazy red-haired kid to me. It is very green, but his mouth was so big. <laughs> you know, it's like, and he was really easy to work with. Um, but he would definitely follow my lead on things to do. He didn't care about the business. I mean, Jason, I guess I always consider myself an artist, but I was very, very in tune with how the business worked because I want record label money to make my band happen. And Jason was just happy getting paid playing shows. Mm. No, even though everything was equally split between us as a partner, no matter who wrote the songs or what, he got half of whatever I did. And I was cool with that because I knew, you know, up until the end that Jason would show up and do it. You know, but like I said, things take different turns and twists and stuff like that as life goes on. And um, there was a time in uh, California Probably one of the, it was that it was definitely the last show we played with uh, Preston Ass and Kobe Jackson, um, which that was my band. Like that was like that was Prime Fifty Five to me. It was Preston Ash, Kobe Jackson, uh, me and Jay, uh, because I was really comfortable playing songs with those guys, and I trusted them. But um, I I I stepped off stage that day, and you know. We were all doing what we did at the time. I don't want to call it rock stars, but we were being stupid. Um, and I walked off stage like, I don't want to do this anymore. I really need a long break. And I don't know what's up with Prime 55. It was always been my decision because it was my band. Yeah. So it's like we all got on four planes home because we all lived in four different states. <laughs> and... The next thing I knew, I was playing a Soulfly. Yeah. Because I, I did need that break. Because mentally, it messed with me. Like, I, I, I couldn't do this no more. I couldn't, I couldn't make another record. 
a prime 55 record at the time. It was too much living. Yeah. Uh, before we get into the Soulfly chapter of your musical career, is there any chance to reform Primer 55 in the future? Maybe. It's going to take me a minute. I mean, I played lots of shows without Jay. Yeah. You were seeing him, falling right? out. A couple tours I did, yeah. And it sucked. I didn't like it. And it, right. it wasn't comfortable. I'm not a rapper. Oh, okay. You know, it's like I can't do the first record at all. But, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I you know, I can't. I'll give it my best, but... Uh, Plus, it's, it's difficult it to was, it was, rap it was never a comfortable thing. Time, right? Yeah, and I'm okay with that, too. But it's just never a comfortable thing for me because I don't think that it... Um, it's just not what it should have been, you know. Um, I had fun doing it. I I wouldn't do it again at all. So are you planning I'm, to get a new member to to replace uh, Jason? That would be hard for me to do. I, I I would consider it, yeah, but it's like it it's it's far from my mind because I people approach me every day about doing tours and stuff like that, about jumping on this tour and jumping on that tour and stuff, you know, but I don't know. Jason, Jason's a hard guy to, to, um, replace. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. So no, no, no plans for the near future to, re the, to resurrect. Not, not today. Not, not at this moment. That could change tomorrow because that's the way I am, but. You know, I, all it takes is a phone call and I'll be good. Mm -hmm. All right. But I'd, I'd have to find that person. Yeah, should be difficult. Oh. All right. Yeah. Uh, how did you get the basis, basis position in Soulfly back in 03, 04? 